circuit. So this was year. a real car. This was a real car, actual oh. functional drivable car. You can see circuit boards here. Henry and Frank Kulik were going to go race in the first Indy 500 in 1911, and uh, officials said, no, this car is too light. If you're one of the up to 1.8 million people a year that walk through the doors of the Henry Ford Museum, I don't have to tell you how amazing this place is. But we've become friends with Matt Anderson. Matt, thank you. Hey, my Matt pleasure. Matt is the curator of transportation for the museum. And he's allowing us today to go into a warehouse that contains vehicles and other things that they don't have room for anymore. So tell us, what, what are we gonna go see? We're gonna go into one of our storage buildings where you're gonna see not just lots of cars, but lots of other artifacts. Fire engine, horse-drawn vehicles, agricultural equipment, all of those things that we, we often just don't have physical room to have on exhibit at this time. I'm ready to go, let's go. Take a look. I've been to the museum, but it's not just about cars. It's about toasters and lawn spreaders. Tell us about what the Henry Ford Museum is. Uh, we collect a little bit of everything. We're a museum of American innovation, and that's not just innovation in transportation, but it's innovation in making your breakfast, or innovation in growing the wheat that goes into the bread that goes into the toast. So even from Henry Ford's time, we were collecting a little bit of everything. Well, where are the cars? Let's go on down. We'll take a look. All right, cool. Like, what am I looking at here? I... This is one of my favorites. This is the 1953 X100. Uh, Ford built this for what was then their 50th anniversary, but it is a fully functional concept car. 1953. 1953. So they, they advertise it as having more than 50 innovations for 50 years. It's got some really cool things. You notice the roof uh, slides back there. It's got a rain sensor built into it, so it'll close itself up if uh, the weather turns dark. It's got a built-in car phone, a radio phone, which is pretty forward thinking. Wow. It's got some weird stuff too. For example, uh, there was an electric razor that was built into the glove box. So you get stuck in traffic, I guess you can shave on your way in. Also has a variable volume horn, which you could use, I guess a little louder in rural areas, softer in the city. This is a one of one. I I guess. Yes, one of one. And, and this car, what Ford made a big deal of this when they took it on the show circuit in 53. They drove it on its own four tires to the shows to kind of illustrate just how functional so it was. So this has mileage on it. It does. It does. It is also a heavy car, close to 10,000 pounds with all that gadgetry in it. So, yeah. But uh, you look at it and you can see a little of the, the Lincoln and even the Thunderbird in the rear end. Yeah, yeah, it comes yeah. a few years later. You have a close affiliation with Ford, but you're not exclusively Ford. So this is made by Ford, but something else here might have been made by GM, right? A absolutely. We collect a little bit of everything. Even Henry Ford was collecting a little bit of everything when, when he was alive. And yeah, as long as Henry was around, it was all kind of the same thing. Ford Motor Company, the museum, it was all under his ownership. But after he passed away in 47, we began to separate ourselves. So we are a separate organization entirely distinct from Ford Motor Company. Show, show us some of the cars that you think that our viewers would be curious about. The good and the perhaps not so good, the way to put it, the 1983 Ocano car is one of my uh, favorites. Ford's right here. A, yes. And Ford's it's a Ford. A, it is a Ford. It uh, never made it into production. We can probably all be grateful for that. <laughs> But oh, it was uh, their attempt to build the cheapest possible car that they could, right? And going through an a recession, rather, in the early 1980s, right? And wow. People looking for basic, honest transportation. Also, trying to fight the imports at that time, too. So, is it fiberglass? It, it is, yes. And it, it's just, just for show, not functional. But uh, Okay. All right. So, what else do we have here? The, the ancient enemy here, a Chevrolet, a 1929, of course, the, the Stove Bolt 6. And that's what kicks off Ford to uh, design the V8, which comes out a few years later. So, you've got to have that. So, that was an overhead valve. Yes, yeah, yeah, the still built. So, you think of it, so what year is that? 29. So, think about 29, Ford was building a, 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 a four cylinder L head or flathead engine. This was an overhead valve six. GM was so far ahead of Ford as far as engine technology at the time. And so, Henry, you know, like so stubborn. They finally gave in and, and produced the flathead V8, which may or may not have been as good as this engine. It's yeah, hard yeah. to say. We also have this one sometimes overlooked. This is a car that was used by five different first ladies of the United States. So it's a Baker Electric 1912, and it was purchased uh, by uh, William Howard Taft, who's the president who motorized the White House fleet. It was used by his wife, both of uh, Woodrow Wilson's wives, uh, Calvin Coolidge's wife, Grace Coolidge, uh, right on up into uh, 1927 when it was finally retired. 
And so you've had it that long? Yeah, we acquired it shortly thereafter, and uh, that was the fortunate thing. Mr. Ford had the resources, and yeah. not just financially, but the network. You know, he, he essentially had a museum drop-off location in every city in the U.S. People could go to the dealer, drop off an object. It got its way here. These are leather fenders. Leather fenders on that, yes. And wooden, bo wooden body? Wooden body, yeah. The leather fenders are sort of like the carbon fiber of the, <laughs> the 1910 period, if that makes sense. Wow. Yeah, cool. lightweight but functional. So is that a running car? Uh, it is not at this time, and that's a great question, too. You know, some of our cars do operate. Well, we tend to not operate them because once you put a car into operation, you know, that's a continuing commitment to keep it going. Yeah, and, yeah, you know, frankly, yeah, we just yeah, don't yeah, have yeah. the resources or the staff to drive 300 cars once a month or whatever it would take. So what else, what else is cool here? Yeah, let's uh, let's walk down another aisle here, look at some stuff. Uh, you know, when we collect cars, we're, we're collecting the cars, but we're also collecting the stories. So yep. cars associated with important people. Uh, got a Buick Riviera under the cover here, designed by Bill Mitchell. So, I mean, you know, arguably one of the most beautiful American shapes ever ever designed. I mean, if you just, just, just look at these lines, just yeah. crisp and just beautiful. Is this an unrestored car? Uh, it is. Yeah, a lot of a uh, lot of the cars we have are unrestored. We have a few restored cars as well. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, the cars on jack stands. Exactly. We try to put every car up on jack stands. Also saves wear and tear on the tires. No so. kidding. <laughs> so we're looking at an electric car, now we look at uh, a sprint car. Yeah, this is exciting. This is one of our newer acquisitions. We just uh, did a new racing exhibit that opened in March of 2021. Uh -huh. And as sometimes happens, that got a lot of interest from other people, came to us with offers. We did not have a World of Outlaws sprint car in the collection needed one so this one was driven by steve kinzer in the man. 1993 season he's the king of outlaws so uh, you couldn't ask for better now there's there's something that i love i am the original myers manx fan have owned one for a while but have admired them my whole life and again a great story we had uh, uh a young man and his grandfather who worked together to build this thing here in Southeast Michigan. So, uh, Isn't that something? intergenerational story. The Myers Manx was named after a guy named Bruce Meyer. He was a, an artist, a uh, surfer, uh, a sculptor, off road racer. Off road racing at the time was like, you know, taking a body off a, an old sedan and shortening the chassis and it had a V8. And he came up with the idea wow, Volkswagen is so light, the engine's in the back, right over the drive wheels. What if we shorten the chassis 14 and a half inches? Put on this fiberglass body. It became uh, an overnight sensation, so much so that because he could not patent this design, numerous other car companies started to make fiberglass replicas of it, and uh, he wound up going from you know, the penthouse to the poorhouse. He, he went bankrupt. Only in recent years, he died recently, only in recent years has he kind of reclaimed that, that automotive sculpture uh, that he built here. This is like a folded piece of paper, and there are some people say this is the most pure automotive form ever made. That, this is cool, early Ford racing vehicle. It is a uh, racer based on the Model K, which was Ford's short-lived six-cylinder car uh, on the road to the Model T. This was driven by a fellow named Frank Kulik, who was Ford's first real factory racing driver. Wow. Really interesting character. Uh, got involved in a bad wreck, in fact, with this car uh, at Lansing in a, a race where uh, broke his leg so severely, in fact, he walked with a limp for the rest of his life. But, you know, like any racer, he just got back in the seat, kept at it after he healed up. And, so what uh, year is it? Uh, this one would have been raced uh, 1906 when the uh, Model K was in production and then continue to be raced a few years thereafter. So but it has uh, a cast aluminum crankcase, and are these like copper covers over the cylinders? Yes, yes. Huh, wow. And it has a provision for two spark plugs per cylinder. It does, it does, but yeah, just a single spark plug in the racing version here, and um, yeah, Ford raced right up till 1913 or so, uh, at which point, you know, they just frankly didn't need to race. They didn't need the headaches. They were selling so many Model Ts already. So uh, how fast could this go? Oh, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. I mean, it would have been close to 100 miles an hour, if not a little better, so. I mean, can you imagine? No seat belts, no roll cage, no protection. Wow. It yeah. took a special kind of courage to drive yep. these cars. Yep, yep. And so this is the original, this is the car. Man. All right, we've got another race car while we're in the, the neighborhood there. Driven by Bill Elliott, set the all-time NASCAR speed record, 212 miles an hour. Oh, I was there. Absolutely. Wow. 1987 and this is the Thunder. car. This is the car, yes. Yeah, we've had it since 1987 through the uh, courtesy of Ford Motor Company. As they were not uh, a part of Ford, that said, we still have a nice shared history, and they often look out for us when there are opportunities to acquire something real special like this. I'm seeing a taxi cab over a yellow cab, and the headlights are not mounted where you think they would be. They're on the cowl. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Do you know why that is? I, I, I don't, to tell you the truth, why on this particular cab they're up on the cowl, but uh, uh -huh. unconventional to say the truth. But 
Yeah, I have to have a cab in the collection. In fact, we've got two of them. We have this one, which is from John Hertz's Yellow Cab Company, the originator of the taxi we think of it. Then we also have yeah. a checker that's on display in the museum itself right now. And that's when people think of cab. I think even today, they still think of checker cabs, even though yeah, they haven't yeah. been built for 40 years. Is this years. a checker? Uh, this is a uh, yellow. So this is so a, it's a brand yeah. yellow. Brand. Yep, the brand was Yellow so, Cab Company. Check this out. There were so few phones. I don't know what town this was in. All you had to do was hire is no area code, no nothing, just 73. And you got the cab company. Like, wow. So I'm looking at the height of this thing. Holy mackerel. Yeah, that uh, belonged to J.P. Morgan Jr., son of the famous uh, financier. But yes, a Rolls Royce. And this one was actually built in New Jersey. Most of them built in New Jersey with left-hand drive. But uh, Morgan ordered this with the proper right-hand drive, or what he thought was proper for a Rolls Royce. So, so. the... Is this, is this a Springfield car? Yes, that's right. That's so the right. chassis was made in Massachusetts, and it was bodied in New Jersey. No yes, kidding. that's correct. But uh, one of those cars that looks like it's one and a half times life size. You know? yeah, yeah. And, you know, <laughs> I look at the Crosley across the way here, like, oh, jeez. Now, here we have a, a sliced and diced Ford GT. Yeah, the, uh, the second generation GT from uh, 2005, and this was put together for, well, I should say it was taken apart for the auto show circuit. So this was year. a real car? This was a real car, actual oh. functional drivable car, and uh, they got in and cut it right down the middle, and it, it's just incredible. I mean, cutaways are an old idea. They've been building those since the, they've been building cars, but uh, to think that that technique still appeals to people in the early 20th century. Do you century. think this literally was a... Was a, a saw going through this? They, they described it as kind of peeling apart a uh, an onion, right? They cut it apart in layers oh, okay. using different techniques depending on what they were going through. You can see circuit boards here. Here's the, the superchargers cut in half. I mean, here's the whole engine. There's the crankcase. <laughs> Jeez. That is a cutaway car. My God. No, another race car. Look at this. Yeah, another Frank Kulik car. This is based on a Model T. Mm -hmm. I, I, two, would hesitate to, I would hesitate to call it a Model T. <laughs> it's got a four-cylinder engine. That's about where the comparison ends. But mm -hmm. uh, as the story goes, uh, Henry and Frank Kulik were going to go race in the first Indy 500 in 1911. And uh, officials said, no, this car is too light. As the story goes, Henry then turned to the official and said, we're building race cars, not trucks. <laughs> like, tell me this thing's wow, too light. Wow, wow, so wow. That was it. Got a car owned by a president of Ford Motor Company here, our uh, 1941 Lincoln Continental, belonged to Edsel Ford himself. This was his car. His personal car. And of course, if, if you had to pick one car to tell Edsel's story, this is it. The Continental is his great contribution to the... Uh, so I, I'm kind of an Edsel Ford fan, and I've read just about everything I can about the, the man. And uh, he, he did so much, or he tried to do so much for Ford Motor Company to bring European styling cutting edge styling to America. Often his father said, no, we're not gonna do that. We're not gonna do that. You know, this is like a piece of automotive sculpture, just fabulous. So this was a coach built vehicle that, you know, kind of mirrored what was going on in, in Europe with Delahaye's and Tabulagos. And, and he built it with a, a 12 cylinder Ford flathead V8, or Lincoln flathead V8. Just beautiful. And this was his own car. And he loved this color, this dove gray. That he, was he, did. Thing. Yeah. he did. He did. Has that been restored or is that original? This is original, so this, uh, we think it's been repainted once or twice, but... Um, well, that's, that's, that might be the most special car in here for me. Yeah, well, you mentioned concept cars. I like this. This is a uh, 1993 Mercury Sable aluminum intensive vehicle, AIV. So the, uh, the body panels are all aluminum. Uh, some of the frame is aluminum. The engine is aluminum as well. You know, for a while, uh, the, the brother to this, Taurus, was the best-selling car in America. I remember when it came out, like, oh my God, you can make a car that looks like that. Yeah. We've, uh, we've got a Taurus on display in the museum, and people sometimes ask, what the heck do you have that for? And they, it's just so uh, omnipresent, this yeah. arrow look, that people forget that it had to start somewhere, yeah. how influential that Taurus was. Well, Matt, I really appreciate, this hey. has been a real special morning for, Our pleasure. You know, for a historian and uh, for a barn find hunter and for a Ford enthusiast. So uh, hopefully you'll see these cars if you come to the Henry Ford Museum. And you'll see these cars maybe rotated in and out of display. So if you've been here once, several years ago, you need to come back again and uh, see what you're constantly working on. So it's a constantly evolving. Yeah, the, the space never looks the same two days in a row. New things coming in, going out all the time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Happy hunting. <laughs>